Are you on now, Yui? Yeah. Uh, okay, no streaming. Okay, start, okay. Anton. All right, thank you very much. Sorry, everyone, for the delay. We have a bit of technical issues here. But uh, okay, let, let us start. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera buat kita semua, for all of us. Uh, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan, Salam Diaspora, and Greetings. First of all, I would I acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we are meeting. I pay my respect to their elders, the past and present and Aboriginal and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. Uh, my name is Anton Tobin. I'll be your host for tonight's event. And on behalf of Indonesian Diaspora Network uh, Chapter Victoria, I would like to say welcome to the webinar series of the history of the struggle for Indonesian independence from Australia. In the second series with the title From Both the Digul to the Land of Hope, Thank you all for coming and join this webinar. Indonesian Diaspora Network Victoria is taking initiative to organize a series of the webinars that cover the history of uh, Indonesia's struggle for independence from the early 1940s to 1950s. This webinars will be held every month until the exhibition is scheduled to be held in Melbourne, Jakarta, and Bali in 2022. Well, the topic for tonight's discussion is from Bovendigul to the land of hope, the history of the struggle of the Indonesian refugees in Australia and in maintaining the status of Indonesian independence uh, in overseas lands against the exile government of the Dutch Indies, or we call it the Dutch of government exile, with, with support from the Australian government and the Australian people at that time from 1943, I mean, between 1943 and 1947. On this occasion, mm. we may listen to the explanation from the resource persons as follows. One will be Ms. John Lingard and Professor Margaret Cartoni and uh, Mr. Bonnie Triana. The program tonight has been changed slightly where the opening speeches will be given after the first speaker presentation and Q&A. The opening speeches will be given by the president of Indonesia Diaspora Network Victoria, Ms. Diana Pratiwi and continue with remarks from Her Excellency Penny Williams, the Australian Ambassador for Indonesia, and Mr. Nicholas Manovo, the Consular of Political Affairs at the Indonesian Embassy in Canberra. Uh, this event tonight will be hosted by our very own moderator, Ms. Devi Shanti. The, for, for, the floor is yours, Devi. Thank you. You still mute? Yep. Okay, thank you, Anton, for the time given to me. Uh, good evening, everyone in Australia and surrounding, and selamat sore waktu Indonesia, dan selamat pagi untuk waktu London. <laughs> My name is Devi Kanti, and I'm the moderator for tonight's program, and thank you for participating and join, join us tonight. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera buat kita semua. Om swastiwastu, namo budaya, salam kebajikan, salam diaspora. Greetings to all. Indonesian Diaspora Network Victoria is excited hosting the second series of interactive discussion on the history of the support for the Indonesian's independence struggle in 1945-1950 by the Indonesian Diaspora Network in uh, by the Indonesian Diaspora in Australia together with the Australian Nation and Maritime Unions against the Netherlands East Indies exile government. The topic for tonight's discussion is from Bovendigul to the land of hope, the history of the struggle of the Indonesian refugees in Australia in maintaining the status of Indonesian independence in overseas lands against, against the exile government of the Dutch Indies, with support from the Australian government and Australian people at that time. This is the story of how the friendship between Indonesia and Australia began. The historic event between the two nations tell a story of solidarity that deserves to be remembered and celebrated. For tonight's discussion, we will present three resource persons who are familiar to all of us. They are, number one is uh, Ms. Jen Lingard. Had, uh, she has a long career teaching Indonesian at the Australian U National University and the University of Sydney. She is currently honorary, honorary associate in the Department of Indonesian Studies at Universities of Sydney. Our uh, guest speaker number two is Professor Margaret Kartomi, uh, Emeritus Professor at Ethnomusicology Monas University. Uh, she is a professor of music at Monas University 
and uh, ethnomuscologist specializing in Indonesia and Southeast Asia. Uh, speaker number three is Mr. Boni Triana. Uh, he's an editor, he's an historian, editor in chief of historia.id. Um, now I'd like to invite Ibu Jen Lingard. She is already known by Indonesian public through the translation of the book uh, Eyewitness by Seno Gumia Ajidharma, which has won the Victorian Premier Literary Prize for Literary Translation in 1997. But not many know that Jen Lingard is also a historian who has been diligent in collecting data that was stranded in Australia during the World War II, 1942 to 1947. Her work is contained in the book entitled Refugees and Rebels, Indonesian Exile in Wartime Australia, published in 2008. So I would like to welcome Ibu Jen Lingard, please Ibu. The floor is yours. Thank you, Debbie. Um, my apologies for the technical hiccup at the beginning. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Happy that you're here now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, now the story, I, I've taken my small section of this webinar um, from the title and I've focused on the people who were in Boven Deagle. Uh, there were many Indonesians in Australia during World War II and, and lots of them contributed to the to the fight for independence, but I'm just going to focus on the group that I think were the most important in, in politicising Indonesians who were in Australia uh, to work for towards independence. So you probably all know that Boven Deagle was the place where the Netherlands East Indies established two camps in the jungle um, in, in Dutch New Guinea where they sent into exile nationalists who had opposed or had taken part in uprisings in the 1920s and 1930s uh, aimed at freeing Indonesia from Dutch colonial um, administration. So they were freedom fighters. They were independent, seeking independence from the Dutch the Dutch people, the Dutch government at the time, or the Netherlands Indies government at the time, treated them very harshly, executing leaders and sending other participants to exile in Tanamera and Tanatingi. They were the two camps where uh, these rebels were, were sent. They were allowed to uh, have their, their families with them. So there were also women and children uh, living in these rather harsh conditions in the jungles of, of Dutch New Guinea. Okay, so that's Boven Deagle. When World War II uh, reached Indonesia with, with, the, with the, ja the Japanese, oh, sorry, the Japanese, I should say, invading Indonesia, uh, it was thought, in a, I thought rather peculiarly, that the Japanese might release these prisoners who would then collaborate with them against the, ne the Netherlands Indies uh, government. So it was decided by various uh, military people, including General MacArthur, who was the commander of the forces in this part of the world, to bring those people to Australia, where there was already uh, a Netherlands Indies government in, in exile in, in Melbourne. So in June 1943, uh, by, by the time this happened, by the way, June 1943, there were probably only about 500 people left in those camps in, in, in Dutch New Guinea, in Boban Deagle. Um, so they were brought to Australia uh, by various means, aircraft, ships, etc., uh, taken to Brisbane. Uh, so they've come from tropical New Guinea to very cold winter in uh, Australia. Uh, then they were transported uh, from Brisbane uh, by train and, the, and then by train from, from uh, Sydney to Cowra, which is in the southwest part of New South Wales. They arrived in midwinter, a freezing, what was described as a, a, a black winter's day and transported to what was then a prisoner of war camp. Now these people were not prisoners of war. They were really being held here, um, well, illegally as it happened. They were 
political prisoners of a foreign country being held in Australia. Such a thing had never happened before. And uh, this, their status was, was really not known to Australian officials. They were cooperating with their allies. And the governor of uh, Indonesia, the governor general, always described people who opposed Dutch rule as psychopaths and criminals. And so Australian officials were told that the people who were being taken to Cowra were psychopaths and criminals. Um, so they were interned in this prisoner of war camp. Um, the males, the men had to wear the kind of uniform that prisoners of war, a uh, prisoner of, of war had to wear. Uh, there were prisoners of war in the camp, Japanese and Italians who were, who were enemy, but the, these people were not anything to do with Australia at all. Yeah. Your title is Bogan Deagle, Bo, sorry, from Bogan Deagle to the Land of Hope. I don't think the people who came here would have felt much hope at that stage. Yeah. If they knew anything about Australia, they may have known that at that time we had the infamous White Australia policy, which was designed to keep people like them out, to keep Asian people away from the country. So um, the rather optimistic title, Land of Hope, perhaps eventuated. Uh, later but at that stage those people had no idea what was going on why they were here uh, so they were interned in this camp and uh, inevitably because they had come from a tropical country to this terrible terribly bleak cold mm -hmm. winter with inadequate clothing when they first arrived inadequate food they were served food that's like, you know, Australians eat great big pieces of meat and potato and whatever, which was had a disastrous effect. Uh, and pre-existing illnesses meant that some of these people died. Um, so as, I, as you can see, I'm focusing on this part of this, the, the whole story. Um, some of these people died, men, women and children, not nine of them in fact died in the, in the short time that they were there. There had been Indonesians in this camp before the Bofan Deagle people arrived. They were uh, Indonesian merchant seamen who had already uh, um, gone on strike against, against the conditions under which they were serving in the Dutch Merchant Navy. Uh, so some of those people had, had died too. And, Altogether in that period, uh, 13 Indonesian people died in that Kaura camp. Eventually, so it was all, there was a lot of secrecy. People didn't know that these, these people were being held. Australians generally wouldn't have had a clue. But somehow or other, perhaps through sympathetic guards at the camp, um, news filtered out that, that these Indonesian political prisoners of the Dutch were being held in an Australian prisoner of war camp. So various pressure groups exerted their influence, um, in particular, the Australian Communist Party and some of the, the nationalists who were in Deagle were uh, members of the PKI, including Sarjono, who was the chairman of PKI at the time. Um, and the uh, Civil Rights Union of Australia, of New South Wales, various representatives started to pressure um, the Australian officials uh, and, and challenge the legal situation of this, this detention. Um, at the time, uh, prisoners of war, uh, sorry, prisoner of war camps used to be visited by representatives of the Red Cross. And the Indonesian people there, the, they were very experienced at political activity and they spoke to the Red Cross, um, a, a lawyer as it happened, um, and presented very articulate documents and petitions and explanations of why, who they were, why they were there. And eventually as a result of the Indonesians own activities and then this support from outside groups in Australia, um, an investigation was carried out to, to find out about the legal, legality of this detention and it was decided that it was in fact quite illegal for us to be, for Australians to be holding political prisoners. So it was decided to release these people. First of all, the single men 
were released and they were sent to various parts of Queensland, Sydney, Melbourne, some of them to work in uh, uh, an employment company helping with moving munitions or with, uh, along with other with Australians. The women and children were sent to Mackay in Queensland, uh, or the families, sorry, the whole families with women and children were sent to Mackay. So obviously a much more uh, kind, a kinder climate for these folks in after the cold of, of Tara. So in Bovendigal then, there were the, the nucleus of, of the nationalists, the experienced nationalists, and the Dutch then brought all those experienced nationalists to Australia, experienced political activists, and then they were released into the community once they, were, once they left Cowra. So they set about politicising um, their fellow countrymen, of, of whom there were about, about 5,000. There were many merchant seamen who had already um, objected to the, to the to, they'd, they'd been uh, influenced by the Australian um, Waterside Workers Union, uh, who talked about the terrible conditions under which they worked. There were many uh, Indonesians in the Dutch, in the Netherlands Indies Armed Forces, and through the through the activities of these Bovendiegel people, various um, uh, organisations were were established. There was one called, uh, well, the Chen Kim and Kim. They were the they immediately were working towards independence, particularly after 1945, 17th of August, when Sukarno and Hatta proclaimed Indonesian independence. That's when things really hotted up in Australia as far as support for the Indonesians who were here. But I maintain that, that it was really a very big tactical blunder by the Dutch to, to bring those nationalists here because they were the cream of, the, of, of, of that group and they were able to, um, to spread the message, uh, the, the desire for ending the colonial regime uh, of, of the Indies uh, with, with, with their fellow countrymen. So, as I said, there were in Mackay, wherever there were large groups of Indonesians, there were independence committee, um, uh, a national Indonesia, I've got, I've got the names here, I forget them all, but um, they, did, they did manage to, it was Parti, Partai Kemerdeka in Indonesia, Sao Palindo, they formed a, a, a merchant seamen union, seamen's union. So these organisations were there ready to move and then move into the Australian population uh, and, and therefore gained a lot of support, as we know, eventually for Indonesia, Indonesia's independence from the Australian population. Um, so that's a sort of very brief, rushed story. About, I, I think my 15 minutes is... <laughs> it's finished. Oh, okay. Wow, that's a very interesting story. Vivian. And very quick. And I didn't <laughs> even get on to, I didn't get on to the many personal relationships that develop between Australians and Indonesians. And, you know, for the Australian population, as I said, we had white Australia policy. They weren't really used to seeing Asian people walking around the street. And uh, the whole history of, uh, I, I might add that one of my, uh, dearest experiences from writing this book was befriending one of those Bogan Deagle, Bourbon Deagle women, um, Siti Hamsina, who became a, a long personal friend of mine, and I was able to take her to Cowra to see the graves, which have now, which I discovered there, the graves of those people who died, which have now been restored by the Indonesian people, uh, Indonesian government. It gives me great pleasure to know that, for example, a couple of weeks ago, the Australian uh, Indonesia Association from New South Wales visited those graves exactly. and as with people from the embassy and they commemorate those people um, who started off in Bovendigal and there they are permanently being remembered in Kara, which, which I think is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Ibu Jane. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Um, 
So the, uh, actually the, about your book, we actually uh, tried to get your books, but no, the book is out of order at the moment, like uh, out of out stock. Of so yeah, out so yeah, so we are uh, hoping that you know uh, we can uh, you can reprint the book again, so we all can so. <laughs> can read the books. Yeah, because it's a very interesting and it's very good uh, story in it. So I think, sorry, Debbie, Debbie, I think like this was really the very beginning of the relationship between our two countries. And, Australia, and it's a yeah. story that I think should be told to you, to Indonesians as well as to Australians. Yes, exactly. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Um, as you know, that I, you know, I spent 12 years um, as a student um, in Indonesia from uh, uh, from primary school to high school, but we never heard the story about, you know, the uh, relationship between Australia and Indonesia. Yeah. So when I heard about this, it was just, mm. for me, it's so big impact. I thought, oh, how come I never heard about this? But anyway, uh, yeah. you know, I read few books, read few articles about this relationship, so it becomes very powerful. So I guess we should, uh, we should remember and we should, um, uh, celebrate our relationship between these two countries. Now yeah. about your book, I haven't, you know, because I haven't, you know, I don't have your book, I haven't read your book yet, but I read a lot of uh, comments or uh, review about your books. It's very interesting. So I have one question, Ibu. Um, so the Dutch government carried out series of evacuations of thousand people, yeah? Not only for the Dutch or Indo group, but also native Indonesians to Australia in 1943. So while the, uh, while the white Australia policy was being implemented since the Immigration Restriction Act 1901. Mm -hmm. So since then, the policy has become weakened, right? So why suddenly Australia changed the policy towards these refugees? There used to be racism and xenophobia, wasn't it? So because of these refugees coming to Australia or come to Australia. So now the policy change. So I'm just wondering what's the reason behind that? Which particular refugees do you mean, Debbie? The Indonesians, so the, the native Indonesians, so the, who brought- You mean back in the day, back in those days? Yes. Yes, yes. well, well, the Indonesians and, uh, were allowed into Australia under a, a temporary arrangement um, because of the co because it was wartime. But the arrangement also was that as soon as the war ended, they were going to go straight back to Indonesia. So the government didn't really change its policy in those days, not in the 40s. It was much later that uh, Australia dropped the white Australia policy. So um, once the war ended, um, the Australian government did everything it could to, to repatriate every Indonesian who was in Australia yeah. Yeah. back. Um, and there were, a, there were some very interesting court cases. And of course, some of the Indonesians who were here had married Australians, so they had to go back and their wives either stayed here or followed them later yeah. and lived in Indonesia. So they didn't relax, they only relaxed these terms of the White Australia policy temporarily um, during the war. And then the repatriation, repatriations took place when the war yeah. finished in 1945 yeah. and, and 1946. Right. Yeah. And, but the Australian government did make sure that the repatriated Indonesians were taken back to the areas held by the Republic, not by, Madre, you know, as you Madre probably Dutch. know your Indonesian history or your of the War of Independence. Um, so they made sure that they were taken to Indonesian controlled areas, not Dutch controlled right. areas. Mm. All right, great. Thank you so, so much. It took a long time you. then, after, sorry, it took a while after that before the White Australia policy was yeah. rescinded. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much, Ibu, for the explanation. Now, we still have a little bit of time. Uh, I give one questions from the audience. If anyone would like to ask questions to Ibu Jen Lingard, because Ibu Jen have to leave early. So mm -hmm. we have one opportunity uh, for audience to raise a question. Is anyone like to ask question? Please uh, raise your hand. Yeah, I see Tante, Ibu Ayla. And Ibu Ayla? And I see yeah. 
Peter Carey as well, but we want to ask something, Prof. Yeah. Um, I, I just got a, a comment uh, for Jan. Um, I'm the descendant of uh, one of the KPM uh, petty officers, Andrew Sarongan, who's actually mentioned in your book. And I just wanted to say that this, um, for descendants like me, your, your book actually uh, put a lot of the pieces of the puzzle in place. So thank you very much for that. And as for the white Australia policy, even though I understand that the Australian government always had planned to repatriate uh, people like my dad, in the newspapers, my parents appeared on the front pages of the newspapers and the media had deported, you know, they, they used this word. And mm. I don't know at the time whether it was to stir up emotions or, or what the purpose was, but um, you know, uh, it was regarded as being, um, okay, repatriated, but also deported under the white Australia policy. So, yes. Mm. There were a couple of um, large cases, big cases, where um, there was one woman who, who took, her, her, she, she came here, she was married to an Indonesian, he yes. died, and then she married an, an Australian, who helped. Annie O'Keefe, was it? Yeah. Annie O'Keefe, yes, you probably yeah. know that story. Yes. And that, that became a bit of a, a cause celebre because she, that they did one, they, they took it to court and the court ruled in her favour, allowing her to stay. Yeah. But that's, yeah. she's the only one that, I mean, there may have been others, but uh, mm. uh, yes. And, and also when you say they use the word deport, it depends which mm. press it was too, because some press were some, some of the media were more sympathetic than others. But mm. I'm very I wish I'd met I'd met you when I was writing my book. I could have had your story there too. Sorry. Mr. Peter Carey probably can give some uh Ibu Jen, you still have time one more okay one yeah, more one more <laughs> yes yeah mr pat peter maybe yeah peter? thank you very much can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. can you hear me yes, yes. I can. yes yeah um you said that it was the first experience of um australians with indonesians with the coming of the bovin deagle 500 um yes. I read somewhere that, that Chifley, who is your foreign minister under Curtin, and was very much uh, an architect of the, um, of the policy of uh, support for Indonesia, had actually visited the Netherlands East Indies in the 1920s and was appalled mm. by what he saw in terms of racism and uh, the whole colonial attitude of the Dutch. So it must have been news on the street in terms of of Australian politicians, what was actually going on in the Netherlands Indies. And it wasn't completely new that this was, this was happening. And um, in Chifley's case, I mean, I think his, his views about the, about the Dutch have been formed quite long before the Second World War. Yes, they may have, I, I'm not aware of that. Um, but I know that the, uh, the propaganda about the Netherlands Indies treatment of the local people was always that they were very benign and um, the people loved loved having them loved being under Dutch right. control because it, and that and that I mean our, our Chifley may have been an exception but most mm. of our officials at first believed anything that the Dutch told them so you know mm. Van der Plus the Governor General's talking about these criminals and particularly the Boven Teagle people I'm speaking yeah. about. Mm. Um, but after a while, when I was doing my research, I was looking at a lot of documents and officials were talking about, among each other. It seems to me, for example, this is not on the white Australia policy, I'm getting off the subject a bit, but different officials would make little notes on the, on the official documents. It seems to me that the Dutch say anyone who's opposed to their uh, colonial rule is a criminal and a psychopath. Uh, so... People were, were waking up to the to the Dutch, you know. It just infiltrated, the percolated through the the, the change of attitude. Um, uh, but I, I'm interested to hear that uh, to hear what you say about Chifley because uh, I, I wasn't aware that he had visited the ne the Netherlands Indies. Had he? Had he he'd, he'd yeah, I mean, I got this from actually Greg uh, Greg Pulgren, who you probably know, uh, and his book, which mm. is about. Um, 
uh, Suharto. Um, but he told me that Chifley had, had gone uh, mm. and visited. Um, maybe it was an official visit, but he mm. came back appalled by what he had seen. Mm. And that was the sort of beginning of the scales fell from his eyes. And, mm. and, and really, he, he, you know, he understood that the, I mean, the nature of, I mean, you know, the Dutch East Indies was like Vervoet's apartheid in South Africa. You know, there was nothing benign about it, no. especially under uh, B.C. de Jong. Perhaps then the fact that uh, Chifley was prime minister when, uh, yeah. you know, when Curtin died and Chifley took his place, mm. he was then yeah. perhaps inclined to be sympathetic and supportive uh, yeah. of the Indonesian cause. And as you know, mm. you know, finally Australia represented Indonesia in the United Nations. Yeah, yeah but that's another part of the story. <laughs> that's a political. And they side. were chosen by the Indonesians. I mean, the Indonesians. They were. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Sorry. All right. Thank you, Papita, for the questions, yeah. and thank you, Ibu Jan, for the answer. Thank and you. Very I think um, that's the time for Ibu. Jan. And. Uh, Devi, may, may I just also remind you that if there are any more questions, I'm sorry, I do yes. have to go, as you know. Um, if there are any more questions, if Devi perhaps could give my email address, I'd be very happy to, to answer any, yeah. anything. Sure. Yeah. Okay. We'll Thank, do you. That. Thank you. Thank you, Ibujan. Thank Can you so much. Thank you so much, Ibujan. Are, are we you. going to have a picture before Ibujan? Oh, yes, leave? of course. Oh, yes, yeah. Take a photo. Take a photo. In front of everyone. From memory. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to take front of everyone to our photo session. And if you don't mind, you may please turn on your, your video now just for this photo session. I think Brother Jeffrey will help us in this in this photo session. Thank you. And after that, I'm handing this to Diana. Who Diana after this, after photo session. Thank you. Okay, uh, get ready. Please turn on your videos. Yeah. Uh, and Am I then... going? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, you go. Everyone, okay. Uh, Kang Boni, yeah. the photo, Kang Boni. Yeah, everyone on? Okay. One, two, smile. Give your big smile. One, two, <laughs> three. Okay, this is the uh, first page. Uh, we still have uh, the second page. One second. I just want to uh, save it. Um, okay, now I'm, I'm moving to the second page. Uh, I don't know who is in the second page, but just get ready. Uh, yeah, please smile. One, two, three. Okay, yeah, it's done. Yeah. Okay, Anton or Madiana, you can continue. Uh Okay, now the, the first remarks will be from the president of IDN Victoria, Indonesian Diaspora Network Victoria, uh, Ms. Diana Pratiwi. Uh, the floor is yours, Diana. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om Swastiastu, Namang Budaya, Salam Kebajikan, Salam Diaspora. Greeting everyone. Firstly, I want to acknowledge the speakers, Ms. Jen Ligard, Prof. Emerita Margaret Katomi, and Mr. Bonitiana, Consular Head of Political Affairs, Indonesian Embassy for Australia, Mr. Nicholas Manopo, the Honorable Her Excellency, Ms. Penny William, Australian Ambassador for Indonesia, all members of IBN Victoria, and Zoominar participants, wherever you are. This is the second discussion of Zoominar series on the topic from Bovendigul to the Land of Hope with all of the great speakers. The next discussion will be in February, 2020, and then we'll, then we'll be held every month until exhibition in April, 2022 in Melbourne and Bali as an effort to build momentum and interest in the long history of Indonesian-Australia relations. Bovendigul was a Dutch prison camp in the Dutch Indies, Dutch East Indies at the headwaters of Digu River where Indonesians from the nationalists and other freedom fighters were interned between 1928 and 1942, including the national movement figures, Muhammad Hatta, Muhammad Bondan, Say Sayuti Malik, and Sultan Shahrir. Many of us are unaware that many Indonesians lived in Australia between 1942 and 1947. And then when the Pacific War broke out and Japan occupied Indonesia, both of the good prisoners were evacuated by the Dutch to Australia. The transfer was based on the concern that prisoners would rebel if they remained at Bovon de Gaulle. The Dutch had tricked the internees into voluntary moving to Australia only to lock them up once again. 
the legal internists who freed due to Australian government intervention were not the first Indonesian in Australia. Shortly after the Dutch surrender in March 1942, Dutch merchant ships made their way to Australia, the crew members of which were prominent, predominantly Indonesians. The digital evacuation was in retrospect not a successful enterprise. It turned out that these political prisoners together with Indonesian shipmen and shipping workers and Australian trade unions were successful in boycotting the Dutch ship that landed in, in the country in order to support Indonesian independent movement. They took direct action in blocking the loading of ammunition and equipment onto Dutch ship in Australian ports. This was how trade unions, Indonesian diaspora and Australian government together supported Indonesian independent offices. This was also the beginning of the Indonesian diaspora in Australia aspiring to contribute to their homeland. Diaspora Indonesia plays a central role in the international system, disseminating information, transmitting capital, transforming culture and bringing the cooperation and partnership between the country they live and Indonesia closer. Diaspora Indonesia contribute and show their love to Indonesia without having to return to their homeland. They contribute to the development of the Republic to build a relationship between in, with Indonesia to build collaboration, partnership, and investment, and build a positive image of Indonesia in the eyes of the world. I hope our discussion today will be based on the people-to-people -people history, pricing the humanist dimension above the political or policy aspect by highlighting the humanitarian dimension of the history of Australia-Indonesia relations. And the discussion will strengthen the legitimacy of historically good relations between the two. I'm sure that Indonesian-Australia partnership at the people-to-people, -people, business, health, military, and academic, and other level will continue to be well established. This area of discussion up to the planned exhibition in 2022 is one of IDN Victoria effort to strengthen the relations between Indonesia and Australia. That's all for me. Welcome to today's discussion. I hope you can take away a lot from this uh, discussion tonight. And uh, thank you. I return to the host. Anton. Think, uh, all right. Okay. The, thank you very much, Budiana, uh, for the remarks. The second remarks will be from the Australian Ambassador for Indonesia, Her Excellency Ambassador Penny Williams, and it, this, this time it will be in a pre-recorded video because she's, Her Excellency was not available at this very time. Thank you. I think Brother Jeffrey will help us in this manner. Good evening. I'd like to thank the Indonesia Diaspora Network of Victoria for the invitation to join this program. I look forward to working closely with the Indonesian Diaspora Network across Australia over the coming years in my role as Australia's ambassador to Indonesia. Diaspora communities are an between our countries. I would also like to acknowledge Ms. Devi Shanti, who will be moderating the discussions taking place later on, as well as experts and guest speakers. Ms. Diana Pratiwi, President of the Indonesia Diaspora Network Victoria. Ms. Jan Lingard, Australian author and historian and former university teacher of mine. Professor Margaret Kartomi, Monas University and Mr. Bonnie Triana, Historian and Chief Editor of Historia ID. As I'm sure many of you are aware, Indonesia and Australia have a long shared history. From the bookish traders of Sulawesi who met and traded with Northern Australia Indigenous communities more than 400 years ago, to the Australian communities who were among the earliest and strongest supporters of Indonesia's independence. We were pleased to join Indonesia in celebrating its 76th year of independence in August this year. In the years following the Second World War, Australia was Indonesia's strongest supporter through its struggle for independence. 
President Sukarno and Vice President Hatta nominated Australia to represent Indonesia in UN negotiations that led to Indonesia's independence. Leading up to that, Australian dock workers boycotted Dutch ships in Australian ports, preventing them from returning to Indonesia after the war with military arms and personnel. These are parts of our shared history that are lesser known to many Australians and Indonesians than perhaps they should be. Australia is incredibly proud of our historical links with Indonesia and we are committed to sharing these stories widely. Working with the Australian National Maritime Museum, we delivered exhibitions, The Black Amada and Two Nations, A Friendship is Born, to cities around Indonesia. We also shared the marvellous film, Indonesia Calling, which I understand you'll be discussing later on in the program. The Australia-Indonesia relationship has evolved over the years and I'm pleased to say today is stronger than ever. We are comprehensive strategic partners, a symbol of the closeness and strength of our relationship. We are also free trade agreement partners and our people-to-people -people links are continuing to grow closer. I'm delighted to be supporting continued discussions around our shared history and supporting spaces where Australians and Indonesians can come together and build stronger links as neighbours and as old friends. Thank you again for the invitation to be here and I look forward to working closely with you again in the future. That's the remark from uh, the Australian Veteran of Indonesia, Her Excellency Penny Williams. And the set remarks for today will be from the Indonesian Embassy in Canberra. And in this, at this time, it will be it will be done by uh, Mr. Nicholas Manopo, the Councillor of Political Affairs at the Indonesian Embassy in Canberra. The floor is yours, Mr. Manopo. Thank you. Thank you, Pa Tobing. Uh, actually, uh, our session of it, uh, Mr. Sharif Alatas should uh, present. Uh, or deliver his remark in this webinar, but he just told me that I uh, I was asked to uh, rep represent him to deliver uh, on behalf of him in this uh, webinar. And he asked me to read his uh, remarks. So let me read his remark. Uh, Ambassador Penny Williams, Australian Ambassador in Jakarta, Ibu Jane Lingard, author of Revenge and Rebels, Indonesian Exile in Wartime Australia, Professor Margaret Kartomi, Professor Emerita Ethnomusicology Monash University, Bapak Boni Triana, historian, chief editor of Historia, Ibu Diana Pratiwi, president of IDN in Victoria, Ibu Devi Shanti, vice president of IDN Victoria, as moderator in this uh, webinar, Pak Nantobing, Pak Jeffrey Riando, Ladies and gentlemen, participants in this webinar uh, from Bovendigo to the Land of Hope. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera bagi kita semua. Om swastiastu, namo buddhaya, shalom. Best wishes to all of us. Selamat pagi di London. Then good evening for all of, uh, uh, for all of us in Australia. Uh, first of all, allow me to express my gratitude for this opportunity to deliver the opening remarks in the webinar from the goal to the land of hope held by Indonesian Diaspora Network, IDN of Victoria. Really welcome and highly appreciate IDN Victoria for organizing this webinar to provide an overview and explanation of Indonesia bilateral relationship with Australia, including the history of Indonesians in Australia during the struggle for national independence. As a neighboring country, Indonesia relationship with Australia is very important, strategic and essential to continue to be developed. Historically, a relation between Australia and Indonesia <laughs> began in early 16th century before the arrival of Europeans through the interactions between Makassar people and indigenous Australians on the West Coast and Northern Australia. During the Japanese occupation in 1942 to 1945, the Netherlands is in this colonial government, which controls Indonesia at the time, is get to establish an exile government in Australia, as mentioned by Ibu Jan Lingard. In its exile, 
the Nai government also brought Indonesian political prisoners to Australia and detained them in various camps. One of them was in uh, Kaura where I visited last time. I met uh, uh, Jeffrey Leandol. Uh, this person was previously detained in Bufundigul, most of them uh, by the colonial government, which considered them to have carried out political activities against the government in fighting for Indonesian independence before the Japanese attack in 1942. They were also suspected to assist the Japanese occupation so that they had to be taken and placed in the Dutch colonial government detention camps in Australia. As their sympathy and support for Indonesian independence, Australian conveyed, Australian conveyed uh, moral and natural support to these Indonesian prisoners in their detention camps. Australian support was also shown in the, in the Black Armada incident in September 1945, where Australian supported Indonesian workers boycott against Dutch vessels and then banned them shipping to Indonesia, which they would allegedly transport material to suppress Indonesian independence movement. And the country was one of the first countries to recognize the independence of Indonesia on December 27, 1949. The Australian community gave considerable support and push for the Australian government to politically, uh, politic, politically and finally recognize Indonesia independence. Even just seven weeks after the proclamation of Indonesia independence, Australia sent its diplomatic mission to meet President Sukarno. Australia also played an active role in consistently providing support to Indonesia after the proclamation and actively lobbied for Indonesia at the UN Security Council when the Dutch invaded Indonesia in July 1945, uh, 1947. In the USS Renfield negotiation, Indonesia nominated Australia to be a member of the UN Good Offices Committee's Three Nation Commission and we well known in Bahasa Indonesia, Komisi Tiga Negara to resolve the dispute between Indonesia and Netherlands which ultimately resulted in the Renfield Agreement. Since Indonesia independence, Australia has recognized the importance of building good relations with Indonesia as a strategic access for Australia's access from the Indian Ocean to the Pacific region. Uh, I can draw you that, you know, how close are Indonesia and Australia relationship today? Australia Indonesia has declared the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership, or we call uh, CSP, in 2018 during Prime Minister Scott Morrison visit to Jakarta. And during uh, President Jokowi visit to Canberra in 2020, uh, the CSP, or Comprehensive Strategic Partnership, was followed up by a plan of action of CSP. And that Countries has enters uh, have entered into force ISEPA. I sincerely hope that by organizing this webinar, we can understand the history of closeness between Indonesia and Australia, especially the role of Australians in supporting Indonesian independence. Uh, thank you for your kind attention. Stay healthy and success. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om Shanti 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 Om. Namo Budaya Salam. Best visit to all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pak Manopo, for your uh, remarks on behalf of Pak Sari. Uh, and now we are back to the presentation by the speakers. I'll leave it to the moderator, Budesi Shanti. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Bang Anton. And now uh, we move to the second speaker, which is Ibu Professor Margaret Kartomi. Margaret Kartomi is a professor of music at Monash University, where she pioneered the teaching and research of Asian music. Over the past 30 years, she and her Monash students have been researching the music of many parts of Asia. Professor Kartomi has also published various research articles on Indonesian or other Southeast 
Asian, Australian Aboriginal, and European music, as well on musicological or ethnomusicological theory. Recently, her field recording from 24 of Indonesia's 27 provinces were presented to Indonesia a Secretary General of Culture for deposit in the National Library in Jakarta. Uh, so tonight, Ibu uh, Margaret will talk about the story of Gamelan de Gaulle and the prison camp musician who made it. So please welcome Ibu Margaret Kartoni. The floor is yours, Ibu. Thank you, Ibu Devi. And uh, thank you to to you and to members of the Indonesian Diaspora Wet Network for inviting me to talk about this topic. It really does build on what Jan Lingard was saying. It's about a gamelan de gul, uh, as we call it. It was about a, a gamelan which was actually made in the Boven de Gaulle camp. There's not many positive things you can say about that notorious camp, but you can say wonderful things about this gamelan de gul, which was, it's a very lovable object. We love it at Monash. It, we have it at Monash now, and I have to explain to you how on earth it came to Australia and how it came to from Bowen de Gaulle to, uh, to the music archive at Monash University through the Victorian Museum, etc. It's a long story and quite complicated, but and it took me about 25 years to put it together and, and publish this book on the Gamelan de Gaulle. And it was also published in, um, translated in Indonesian and published in 2002 in Indonesian. So it's quite well, well, widely read, I think, in Indonesia. Um, it's a, a very long story, but I'd really like you to hear the instruments because it's so beautiful. Um, you know, it was made from anything to, it was made from kitchen utensils. You know, it was made by a very famous musician. He was a brilliant musician, but he was also a passionate revolutionary. And he was arrested in 1926 and exported. Uh, sorry, uh, Prof Margaret, are you presenting or? Are you still? Because I couldn't see your presentation. Yeah, please, um, um, Jeffrey, would you put my present my presentation up, please? Okay, I'll, I'll share. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyone? Yeah. Can yeah. you see? Yeah. Uh, that is, uh, that is, uh, I can see. At Monash University, um, uh, arranged for playing. We have played it in quite a few concerts, but. We don't like to play it very often because it's very fragile. It's 96 years old and um, it's been conserved by the uh, Melbourne University's conservation unit. But we don't like to play it very often because, because it's so fragile and so loved. And, but we have played it quite a bit. But I'd like you to hear some of the, the sound of it so that, you know, when you hear it, um, you can remember it and remember the story I'm going to tell you about it. So say we start with that top. Um, um, clip there, please, Jeffrey. This is the the instrument on the right over here. This gandera here on the right at the top. It's a gandera with um, floating keys over bamboo resonators. Can you hear it? Can you repeat it and make it make it uh, more like louder? Increase the volume. Okay. Maybe you repeat it and increase the volume. Well, now the second one. This 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 front instrument here, the bonang in the front. It's made of kitchen utensils and it sounds not really like a bonan, but it's quite nice. So you can see the gamelan de Gaulle is not a beautifully ornamented resonant gamelan, just like those you might have heard from Central Java. It's um, it's got its own unique sound. Um, it's this photo um, of the gamelan here in playing position. 
shows you that the bonang in the front was made of rantang. They just kettled the kitchen utensils here. And um, they're, they're, they're all tuned beautifully. Now, this is a, a diagram of the instruments. You just heard these here. These are the kitchen utensils here in the beginning, in the front of the bonangs. And then anything else that they could find, um, bits of metal and bits of wood, they had to go, the, the, the Gould prisoners had to go into the forest to cut down timber and build their own houses as well as, and this is an opportunity for the maker of this, um, in this orchestra to get, in, get the uh, materials to make this, this, this complete gamelan. In the back here, there's a katuk, there's a gong de day. Um, it's, I, I tried to put the recording on the, uh, the, the um, speaker, but it didn't actually work. But it's, it's, a, it's an instrument that replaces the hanging gongs, the big, big bronze gongs of the beautiful gamelans uh, of the courts in, in central Java. It's just got um, two pieces, you can see there, it's just right at the back there, the Gonga Day Commandant. It's, um, it's got two keys that are struck together by one big hammer so that they sound a little out of tune with each other. They're just tuned slightly differently, so it sounds like a gong. And underneath there's a big um, porcelain um, jar, which makes it, makes it resonate. And then there's the gumbum down here, the, um, the bronze, the, the, the wooden, Xylophone. You can see that some of the uh, instruments, some of the um, keys are missing, and this also these gumbangs and these uh, metal metallophones. And there's no drum. The drums were lost, unfortunately, but there was one saron here. So all the horizontally instruments uh, organized instruments are tuned in slendro, da, 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 da. and all the vertical instruments are tuned in pelog. Uh, and that slendro is da 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 da, Kellogg is da 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 da, and other modes. Okay, so we move, move to the next slide, please. Um, I'd like you to hear, the, to remember those those sounds, which are really. <laughs> um, you, you have to hear the whole gamelan to hear the the real the real um, impact of it. Now the performers in a wayang orang performance at Tanamera. This is a, just a shot from a book by a Dutchman, Schoenheit, uh, published in 1936. Um, apparently the, the Dutch believed that as part of their official policy of ethical norm normality, which is a very strange term, the inmates were allowed to engage in various cultural and sporting activities. However, as in the Nazi extermination camps, inmates were making their music under duress duress and to serve their rulers in a bizarrely inhospitable and cruel environment from which no escape was of course possible. And there's another shot now, uh, Jeffrey, please, that you can see um, of another performance. The next slide, please. Um, of the clowns and dancers in a Javanese theatre performance at Tanamera at the, uh, in the camp. Um, Pancha, Pancha Gnawit, who is the name of the man who made the gamelan, he was the designated leader of all Javanese musical activities there. There are also Minangkabau and other musical groups, but uh, the Javanese one was what Pancha Bonawit was leading. Um, and uh, he, he uh, his gamelan performed uh, to accompany these, these theatrical shows. Um, but as was commented, music making allowed the prisoners some respite from the harshness of their lives. However, the cultural activities reflected ethnic divisions with the Dutch usually using traditional Javanese culture and art as an instrument for sharpening the contradictions of Java against the other non-Javanese in the camps, like the Minangkabau and the, the uh, people from Kalimantan and Sulawesi, aiming to supersede political ambitions, their ambitions by an interest in matters of a more social and domestic nature. So let's move on to the next slide, please, Jeffrey. Uh, but before, before I get to this, this is the Hotel Metropole in Melbourne, where the Gamelan de Gaulle eventually ended up in 19, uh, when, the, when the Dutch, when Jan Lingard told the story of how the, all those 500 people from, from, the, from de Gaulle were transported to Australia. They were transported with the Gamelan. And first of all, they went to Kaura and stayed there for a while. And during that time, the instruments were actually painted. And, restored a little bit 
And then some of the people who went down to Melbourne, some of those ex tikulist people, um, they, they used to play the, uh, the instruments of the Gamelan de Gaulle on Friday nights in the hotel where they were staying. The Dutch put them in, uh, the Dutch government in exile in Australia, put the de Gaullists with the Gamelan de Gaulle in this room at Indonesia, Hotel Metropole um, in uh, central Melbourne, in the corner of Burke and Elizabeth Streets. No longer there, but um, uh, at that time, um, that's where the one of the one of the places where the Jack, the uh, the uh, de Gaullists, ex de Gaullists were living, and they used to play the Gamelan de Gaulle every Friday night for Australians, and in this way, and they also played in parks and other places. Um, a lot of uh, Australians were introduced to the music of of uh, Java. And this is a way, one of the ways in which the de Gaulle's met many, many Australians. And so it, it, this today, the, um, you know, when we, are lo we loan the Gamelan de Gaulle instruments sometimes to other museums in uh, Sydney and Canberra and Melbourne, et cetera. And uh, they usually comment that this, is, this Gamelan is really a symbol of the beginnings of Indonesian Australian friendship. Because before this, there were not many, as um, Jan Lingard was saying, there were not many uh, contacts between Indonesians and Australians. So this hotel metropole story is quite an interesting one. But this um, assumes a long story about Pat Poncho himself. So if we move down, um, move down a couple of uh, slides, please, to Pat Poncho himself. There's a photo of Pat Poncho here playing the rebub. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, it's a long story. P Poncho Rak Pangrawa was born in 1896 in central Java in a very poor family, but because of his brilliant skills in music making, um, he was given a job at the age of 13 in the palace as a musician, and he could play all the instruments brilliantly, and he, he developed repertoire, and he invented a new kind of gamelan called a sitaran, um, which is still popular in Java. He was a, a most magnificent musician but he was also a very passionate revolutionary and he got caught up in the revolutionary struggle um, and uh, was arrested by the Dutch. Uh, he um, was uh, very much uh, appreciated by the uh, people, the, uh, the, the sultan in the palace at the time, but uh, of course he was treated as a servant as all, all musicians were. And uh, so he, didn't, he was sent to de Gaulle and he made that gamelan that you've just seen um, having made um, gamelans uh, as a profession in solo in central Java himself, he was a he was a very good maker of instruments. And um, then eventually uh, he uh, uh, was sent back to Java in 1932 because um, well uh, the, there were hundreds and thousands of parent, uh, parent political prisoners and there was just no room for everyone. So certain people were sent back to Java. Unfortunately, when he got back to Java, his uh, son wouldn't speak to him. They, if he was um, regarded as a, as a communist and ex-communist, and uh, he was just um, treated very, very badly. However, eventually he got a job back in the palace because he was such a good musician, and he survived for a few years. And then in 1950, he, he got a job in the, um, the first conservatorium of music ever created in Indonesia in Solo. And here he played the rebub. Um, that's one of his instruments. And uh, he, he was very, very uh, the most sought after of teachers. And some of his pupils were very famous musicians as well. So I was just thinking you might like to hear him playing the rebub in the early 50s when he was at the, um, at the conservatory. <laughs>
was a recording uh, made by Mantel Hood, who was one of his, his um, pupils. Mantel Hood was a professor of, of um, music, of ethnomusicology in, in, in the United States. This is another photo of Paponcho um, playing while well, he was sitting ready to play in a class in Coca in the conservatorium in the 1950s. Some of his former students said they preferred to study with him partly because he sat in front of them and taught the rebub backwards, bowing with his left hand, although he was right-handed, so they could easily imitate his physical playing movements. He was quite an extraordinary man, this Poncho. And he got the, you know, he was his his mate, his his family name was Slamet, but the uh, the local or the, the Sultan of Solo gave him this great honor uh, of Poncho Pangawit, giving him this title Poncho Pangawit. Pangrawit is a music, uh, master musician of Gamelan, and his first name is well, it was Poncho Pangrawit was this man who was a brilliant musician. And uh, so, but his, the story of his life is a little sad. Um, if we just go on, uh, go on to just two, two more, please. Uh, Jeffrey, two more slides. I'm going to go to his, no, after this, I'm going to show you this one again in a minute. Um, this is me playing uh, an ordinary gamelan and uh, Puriono, who was employed at Monash for a long time, um, who was playing the, the, the kitchen utensil. Bonang. But I'll, do you just go to the next slide, please? Because I'm telling the story of uh, Poncho. Uh, Poncho Pangawit died. Uh, everyone's, well, uh, the, the long story was that um, no one knew. Well, first of all, I went to his grave in, um, with his, well, his relatives. I went to him to Solo and met all his relatives. And uh, they gave me a rather disturbing story that P Poncho was not actually killed according to this grave, which was, which was constructed by Suharto when they gave him, um, President Suharto, uh, when they gave him honor of, um, you know, on Heroes Day of being a, um, a hero of the revolution. Because the grave has got three inscriptions on it, two of which can be seen here, a hint at the mystery that masks the reality of his death. Although the official inscription on this grave probably added when the grave was restored by the government in 1987, gives his death date as the 11th of October, 1971. The strong probability, according to his, uh, his relatives and students, ex-students, is that he was arrested as a communist ex degulist and killed in prison on Heroes Day, 1965. That's seven years uh, before 1971, the, the date. I, I joined the meeting. And he was killed in prison on Heroes Day, following the so-called coup d'etat of 13th September. His former students say that uh, he disappeared after that date. In 19 they never saw him again after 65. And of course, to be accused of a communist at that time has been an extremely dangerous accusation ever since. If we just go back now, please, to the photo of um, Bono. Um, just before that, thank you. The one before that. Oh, uh, uh, sorry, maybe I have to tell this story as well. Uh, the next one, please. Yeah, Rumah, Indonesia. Um, when the, no, no, the Rumah, Indonesia back there. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Um, going back, the story is very long and complicated. So, and it's got many parts to it. But we go back to the um, ex-degulists, not, not Poncho Pangawik, because he wasn't sent to Australia. Um, this is the, the ex-degulists that Jan Lingwag was talking about. Uh, and they were, they were playing the gamelan, as I said, in um, on Friday nights in 1943 to 45, uh, before they went back to Indonesia after independence was announced. Uh, but if you just go to the next next slide, please. Um, the Degulists were actually active. Um, in this case, this is a, a shot from the film Indonesia Calling. This is a, and it's not, these are actors playing, they're not actually ex degulists they didn't get photos of what they were actually doing, but this is actually Indonesians, um, including degulists monitoring the proclamation of the Indonesian Republic on radio in Australia. Um, Indonesians, including the ex degulists and other gamelan players in Melbourne and other Australian cities, kept in constant contact by radio with the revolutionary movement in Indonesia and its leaders as they passed on the flow of information Indonesia's independence struggle caught the imagination of many Australians 
despite the fact that the Australian government at that time officially supported the Dutch, as, as was being commented by Jan Lingard. So um, today, uh, we, we've formed the Gamelan Bigo quite a few times, um, but we don't want to do it too much anymore because it's, um, it's as, as I said, it's just so fragile. Unfortunately, it's so fragile, we, we can't um, play it much anymore. Every time it's moved, uh, um, it, some, some damage uh, is, happens. But the story of the Gamelan de Gaulle actually does end. It, it's not going to end here. Um, it's, it's being preserved in the music archive of Monash University, and it's been restored. And every time some problem happens with it, well, then uh, we, uh, we get it fixed. We look after it very well. And uh, it's been displayed. We, we did a concert once, the whole story of the Gamelan de Gaulle, in which all the students at Monash acted it out and the, story, and the students played the Gamelan de Gaulle. And then it's been played in many concerts, but, and it's also been. <laughs> so I just like to tell you again that this is a very beloved set of instruments, 96 year old venerated instruments at Monash uh, we're looking after now. And uh, it's, it's replete with imagery and with um, um, uh, stories and of um, emotional effects, emotional, um, well, the people who play it, the people who see it, the people who come out from Indonesia to look at, look at it, see it as a very emotionally uh, stimulating uh, example of a positive thing that came out of the Boven de Gaulle and uh, will be a symbol of Australian-Indonesian friendship, the beginnings of Indonesian-Australian yeah. friendship uh, forever. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ibu Margaret. What a very interesting story about this gamelan. Um, yeah, I didn't realize that is 96 years old. Yes. This gamelan, wow. And um, yeah, well, yeah. So hopefully this this lasts forever. <laughs> yeah. Now, from one of my reference, uh, it said that from the last Digulis depart Melbourne, they decided to thank the Australian people for their friendships and support by giving them a gift of one of their most precious possessions. It was the gamelan that was made at Bobendigo and brought all the way to Melbourne. Now, an Indonesian guy called Jack Zakaria is interested with the task of presenting the gamelan to the Museum of Victoria. And he did it in August, 1946. Now, how is the journey of this gamelan since then? until it's stored at Monash Uni. Would it be possible to return to where it came from? Yes, well, Jack Jacaria did, in fact, uh, uh, part of my research uh, um, you know, brought, brought my attention to this. Jack Jacaria was one of the ex -degulers. He brought it to the Museum of Victoria right. and uh, it stayed there, but it didn't have any, they lost the, uh, the documentation now, in 1975, I was already employed as a, as a lecturer in Indonesian music at Monash University, and the Museum of Victoria rang me up one day and said, uh, would you like to come in, Margaret, and look at these instruments? They're a bit weird. They, they look a bit strange. You don't know where they came from. They might be from Indonesia, but uh, would you like them? Because we don't have any room for them anymore in the gamala, in the museum. And so they, I came in, and uh, when, I, when I saw them, first of all, I had no idea where they were because they didn't have any documentation. I had no idea that this was a, uh, it, but it looked like a, a poor person's gamelan from very poor villages in Java, you know, with that, that gong, which is made, you know, it's not on a hanging gong, but a, um, a, a two-key strike gong, and then, and then it looked like a gamelan. And so I was very pleased to receive it. They said, would you like to have it at Monash? And I said, yes, I'd love to have it. And I'm so glad we did because, and then it took me 25 years to put the story together. Wow. Uh, and I went to the Radio Australia and I met Radan Munanda, who was one of the ex-Degoulists. He was working there, but he, he, was, an old, he was the oldest uh, person in Radio Australia at that time. And he told me the story. He said he knew Poncho Pongroet 
he, he that he actually made this gamelan and that he used to play it in the in the, in the camp from 1926 on and he told me how um, it really uh, it really was terribly important for the for the psychological health of the musicians or of everyone there who, who they used to play it every day and it was just you know a solace for them and, uh, and lots of other people listened to it and of course they made um, all those uh, you know they used to have put on theatrical shows right way on orang etc based uh, um, with the music from the gamelan de Gaulle. and uh, then he told me how um, uh, Pacha Murawit himself went back in 1932. Uh, Radha Munanda did not. He was staying there. He, he was had to stay there. And then he was transported to Australia through Kaura down to Melbourne. And then he got a job in the Radio Australia. Koswara Sumami Jaya, um, who was a very, very, very good musician, also employed at the Radio Australia. He helped me. Uh, we, we talked, had a lot of interviews with Radha Munanda. He told me how in Australia, um, the ex in the Ruma, Indonesia, which he told me all about too. I wouldn't have known about that if, if he hadn't told me. He was the only person in Australia who knew about it. It's just amazing that he was still alive and, you know, because he died soon afterwards. And, um, and he said how they used to play on Friday nights and, and uh, they got to know lots of Australians and some, some women married the, the people who used to play the instruments. It was just, yeah. a, just a, an instrument which was a very great importance um, now, uh, the Australian government, uh, um, foreign affairs, gave us some money back early on to restore the instruments. And they moved the gamelan from um, the, embassy, the Indonesian embassy in Canberra to Monash. And we used to play it every night uh, uh, for, for thousands of school children. We made, raised money to make our own gamelan that way. Uh, but they, uh, they said, but then after that, then we got money, a grant from the government and also, yes, from the government to get the Grimwade Institute at Melbourne University to spend about two years restoring the instruments. And they wrote a, about a 500 report, 500 page report about the gamelan. Oh. And uh, so the Australian government regards it as uh, the possession of the Australian people, um, the the. A brother, brother of President Suharto came out one day and he tried to buy it for a private museum wow. uh, in Jakarta, but um, the Australian government didn't agree with that. And so, and then in the meantime, other, other Indonesian, uh, so my, all my um, recordings, recordings of the Gamelan de Gaulle and my field recordings from many parts of Indonesia were donated, copies of them were donated to the uh, Jakarta library. They're all there for people to hear, and uh, we would like to send the gamelan de Gaulle to Indonesia, but we're just it's so, so fragile, we're just frightened that if it did go to Indonesia, um, that it might just disintegrate, and it's such a valuable yeah. symbolic and um, object, symbolic ob object, but also, you know, it's, a, it's such, got a, such a, an important story for the relationship between Australians and Indonesians. So um, up to now, we haven't actually agreed to that, to yes. sending it to Indonesia yet. <laughs> yet. Okay. Mm. Thank you, Ibu, for the explanation. Uh, so the gamelan has been with the Monash Uni for what, 25 years, you just said? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So, um, so who knows that the gamelan could be returned back to Indonesia? Uh, it depends on, you know, communication between these two countries. But as your personal view, Ibu, uh, what do you think? Is that possible, you think? You just oh. said the, the, the gamelan is very fragile, but you know, yeah. with the modern technology, I don't know, they can just pack it properly, secure it properly, and then send it over. What do you think? Well, it's not what I think, because there is a, um, an official board has been set up to protect the Gamelan de Gaulle. And it's got a whole lot of people on it who, and uh, the people from, um, who restored the Gamelan from the Grimwade Institute at Melbourne University recommended at the end of their 500 page report that it not be played at all again, wow. because it's too, it's too fragile. Yeah. Even though they restored it, you know, there's still uh, little insects still get into it somehow. Oh, okay. And, uh, you know, it's well at, at the moment, Monash is now building a new gallery. 
uh, for mus of musical instruments for MAMU, for the music archive. And that's going to be totally, um, the, the, the new glass cabinets going to be top museum quality. And they will not allow, they will not enable any, they will prevent any kinds of insects getting into the, into the, okay. into them. And so we're hoping that this will um, stabilize it. And eventually, perhaps it could go to Indonesia, but it's not up to me, it's up to the, right. the board. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, Ibu. Uh, well, we would love to see the gamelan next time when we, you know, have a chance to go to Monash to visit. Yeah. Mm. All right, thank you very much, Ibu. Uh, um, so we can um, move to the last speaker for tonight, which is Mas Boni Triana. He mm. is a historian and currently editor in chief of the first history magazine in Indonesia, namely Historia magazine. Uh, Mas Boni is also a curator revolusi exhibition, uh, sorry, pan, uh, exhibition, sorry. He's also a curator revolution exhibition in rich museum in Amsterdam. Is that right, Pa Boni? In so please welcome. Museum. Yeah, please welcome Pa. Uh, yeah, thank Boni. you. Thank you, Mbak Devi. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me uh, this uh, meeting. Um, to be honest, I'm very uh, stunning with uh, Ibu uh, Margaret Kartomi, who explained about the Gamelan Digul, which is actually I'm trying to contact with you, Ibu, because actually Rex Museum want to have loaned this Gamelan for the exhibition, but because of the uh, condition of the Gamelan, of course, of course, this is no not uh, you know possible to to bring the Gamelan to the Netherlands. But I would really love to see it, you know, <laughs> directly. Maybe if I have opportunity to uh, visit uh, Monash University. Yes. Uh, yeah. Actually, we, we can loan, we have loaned um, one or two instruments that are stronger than the others to other museums in Melbourne and Sydney, in Melbourne, Canberra and Sydney. But it's possible we might be able to send one instrument or something like that. Oh, but, okay. Yeah. Talk about it. <laughs> that's good. Well, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, um, I'm going to... Uh, Present. Uh, uh, can Better I send Australia, Bonnie? Yeah. Nini. Hey. You better come to Australia. Hello, ma. Yeah, Ma, Ma Nining. Yeah, apa kabar, Ma? Uh, can I share uh, uh, screen? Yes. Yeah. Well, this is just a simple uh, presentation from me. Uh, first, I would like to apologize if uh, my English is not so uh, uh, fluent. So I'm going to uh, read my uh, paper, and of course, I'm trying to translate my uh, my own article, my own uh, paper, with help of Google. But I found uh, some, you know, sentences uh, becoming hilarious. <laughs> and also, I would like to say thanks to Mbak Devi who has been uh, translate my uh, paper. So. Um, Wait. Uh, on so okay. On 10 September 1935, Sultan Sahrir, later Prime Minister of the Republic of Indonesia, sent a letter from his exile in Bovendigo to his wife Maria Dujatu in the Netherlands. The letter replied to Maria's request to Sahrir to explain about the condition of the people in Bovendigo. Sahrir explained it in a tone of doubt and wonder. Miskel, he said, there is no news if I state that I have not met any communists in Tanah Merah, which is in accordance with the meaning of the word communist in Europe, wrote Sahrir to Maria. <clears throat> Sahrir arrived in Bovendigo with his compatriots. Muhammad Hatta and Muhammad Bondan on January 28, 1935. The colonial government accused them, the political activists of the Indonesian National Education or PNI Baru, the new uh, PNI, of inciting or spread hatred against the authorities, the colonial authorities. When he arrived in Bovendigo, 
Bopendigo's population had decreased compared to the first five years since it first opened. Less than a week after the November 20, 1966, sorry, 1926, rebellion of the uh, Indonesian Communist Party in Java, the Governor General of the Dutch Indies, ACD de Graaf, decided Bovenigo as a place of detention for extremely dangerous communist leaders, he said. The first 50 political prisoners began arriving in Bovendigo in March 1927. On 15 April 1927, the Graf issued an order to send all the conflict involved in the incident to Bovendigo. Referring to Petrus Bloemberger in the Communist Beweging in the Netherlands, India, around 13,000 people were arrested for their alleged involvement in the uprising. Some, of, some were released. 3,000 people were detained in West Java. 2,000 others were detained in West Sumatra. And more than 4,500 people were sentenced to prison. Several of its leaders, such as Egom, Dirja, Bakri, Hasan Bakri from Ciamis, and Haji Sukri or Haji Mukri from Pandeglang were sentenced to death. The Governor General of the Dutch is in this imposed ban on the PKI, Indonesian Communist Party, and its underbow, the Sarekat Rakyat, throughout the Dutch is in this. Everyone who has ties to the organization and is found to be involved in this violence and uh, disturbance of public order will be sentenced to a maximum prison term of six years. By exercising the right of exorbitant recht based on article number 37 of Dutch East Indies Constitution or Netherlands India Strat Regeling, article 37, the, the, the Governor General with the approval of the Ratva Netherlands India has the right to exile people deemed to end it, to endangering public order. On this basis, at the end of 1927, the, the Governor General of Dutch East Indies, ACD de Graaf, made Bovendigul New uh, Guinea, now Papua, are uh, an area for the uh, disposal a political prisoner involved in the event of 1926 uh, communist uprising. About 1,300 communists were exiled to the camp, which is known as an endemic area for the deadly black uh, malaria. Since the same year, the colonial government has also tightened the control over the red danger which since the early 1920s launched, launched agitation and propaganda against the colonial government. The colonial government divided the prisoner settlement in Bovendigul into two uh, areas, the Tanah Merah and the Tanah Tinggi. According to Bung Hatta in the book, uh, in the uh, memoirs of uh, Sahrir, that was published in 1980, at, uh, at that time, Tanah Merah village was divided into two based on its inhabitant or the internee. The two parts are also separated by, by a road, which is about two uh, meters wide. My house is on that street. The right side of the road is called village B, Bunghata said. On the left is village A. According to him, according to Bunghata, the people living in village A choose not to work for the government or for uh, local authority. They are called naturalists because they receive food ration for man uh, in kind of uh, 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 local government because you know uh, the local authority uh, give them uh, you know food. Uh, com comprised of uh, 18 kilograms of rice, 2 kilograms of salted fish, and then also uh, uh, 30 
grams of tea, uh, 300 grams of uh, green beans, and uh, one bottle of coconut oil. And pillage B is inhabited by the where will or work, uh, willing to work, a group who work for the local authority to earn 40 uh, cents a day. While the third group are those who refuse to work with local authorities at all. They refuse to clean their own dwelling. They brand it as a on or uh, literally in English, uh, no peace. Or um, they, uh, you know, they don't want to uh, work in any form of cooperation with a local uh, authority. This group is based in Tanatinggi. Uh, it's approximately a day journey upstream of uh, the Digul River. For Sahrir, the communists in both Digul were, were more worthy of being called revolutionaries with an overwhelming rebellious spirit than as a communist with revolutionary awareness and adequate knowledge of Marxism. Quote, what is reassuring to me that is most of these people who were exiled here, even, even though they were not communists, did, did really want to rebel. Sari wrote in the same letter to his wife. According to him, to be able to understand the communism that some of the prisoners in Digul embraced by studying their native culture. Some of them came from the areas known to be religious, even syncretic. Quote, if people want to understand them, people have to understand them as a Javanese, Minangkabau, and others. Only, they, only then we can, uh, can we judge their communism. And because of, the, because of that, their communism is strange, full of mystic, colored by Japanese Hinduism or Minangkabau Islam or Banten Islam, meaning that in all three, there is an animist element, said Sahrir, adding his explanation to his wife. Sahrir's explanation is acceptable when he considered the fact that the PKI rebellion in 1926 also received support from Muslims as happened in Banten and Sulaka, Silungkang, West Sumatra. And the resistance was launched against Dutch colonialism that had ruled Indonesia for centuries. Bung Hatta also once said that the Indonesian communists was actually a nationalist spirit because their first goal was not a class struggle against the capitalists, like the communists in Europe, but against uh, the Dutch colonialist ruler for, for, uh, to liberate Indonesia. For, or for Indonesian independence. When the Japanese invaded Indonesia in March, on March 1942, uh, the Dutch colonial government brought the political prisoner Digo uh, to Australia, but they also transferred to the government of the Dutch East Indies. Meanwhile, Queen Wilhelmina had already moved the government in exile in London, England, when the Nazi occupied the Netherlands on May 10, 1940. The Australian government accepted open, with open arm the transfer of the Dutch is in this colonial government to its country and continuously provided support to the colonial government in the situation of the Second World War. The attitude was also shown by them when they were willing to accept about 524 legal politi political prisoners were called by the colonial government as dangerous prisoner of war because they had a potential uh, uh, support to Japanese uh, uh, fascism, to Japanese uh, fascism. According to Muhammad Bondan in, in his memoir, uh, he wrote that at first, the Australian government never knew that the prisoner taken uh, were actually pre political prisoner, not the prisoner of war. Apparently, we were said to prisoner of war. Quote, apparently we were said to be prisoner of war. Indeed, that's what, uh, what Bart, uh, Van van der, Plas, van der Plas said in Brisbane newspaper. Perhaps the representative of the colonial government was embraced to say frankly everything that we exile from legal 
are political prisoners, not prisoner of war for fear of being at court uh, with Siberian uh, gulag. Bond and road. After several letters were successfully smuggled to Australian government through the Indonesian Australia Solidarity Organization, according to Molly Warner, Warner the organization secretary who later became Bond and wife, the Australian government sent an envoy to meet political prisoner from me. Since then, the political prisoners are free to move out of their detention camp. Some even work to help the allies along uh, with the Dutch uh, behind uh, the war line. The alliance between communists and Indonesian nationalists with the Dutch, according to historian Harry Puzo, form a strange alliance between them. The situation of the Second World War and the Soviet uh, Union alliance with the United States against German fascism in the West and Japanese fascism in the East were the reason why they were able to sit in the same room. According to Puzo, the alliance was, uh, was the reason for the founding or the foundation of the Indonesian Baru Union or Sarikat Indonesia Baru Sibar in May 1944. After Indonesia gained its uh, independence on August 17, 1945, the political dynamic among the Digulis uh, or uh, Digul prisoner in Australia also changed. The Dutch attempt to recolonize Indonesia with help of the British allies, allied, allied forces. Both the British and the Dutch turn, uh, you know, they, they don't want to see any political uh, development in Indonesia after the defeat of Japan. The Dutch insist to control Indonesia as before the Japanese invaded Indonesia. Meanwhile, the Indonesian people who have, uh, you know, national awareness since the early of 20th century have declared together to become an um, independent nation. By accompanying the arrival of British allies to Indonesia, the Dutch begin to carry out their terror. War is unavoidable, as, as happened in Surabaya during October until November 1945. From Australia, the Dutch government sent a number of war equipment to Indonesia. This is where the solidarity of the Australian people with Indonesia has seen more clearly at that time. After the strike on, uh, after this, after the strike action of uh, 85 Indonesian sailors at the port of Brisbane to prevent the ship loaded with ammunition from sailing to Indonesia occurred on 21st September 1945. Action to support Indonesia independence become more widespread in Australia. On the same day as the strike, the Independent uh, Indonesia Committee or Committee Indonesia Merdeka was formed. It seemed that the story of solidarity between the people of Australia and Indonesia, which was moved by the action of sea first and for workers, is now not much remembered and even tend to be forgotten. Now Indonesia Australia relations are more often seen from the business interests of the two countries, which only revolve around the question of how much profit is obtained and from these activities for the two countries. The relationship was established in up and in up and down the condition and even filled with suspicion. As is known, since the implementation of Immigration Restriction, Restriction Act in 1901, the Australian government has strictly adhered the, to the white Australia policy. As Jan Lingard, uh, as Jan Lingard writes, the outbreak of the Second World War in the Asia Pacific region has opened eyes to the importance of Australia's relation, relationship with Indonesia. It closes neighbor to the north and the pub and uh, the, 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 relations, the relationship within two countries, within two people, actually started not from the relation between government, but from the close relation between, or close solidarity between the Australian and Indonesian 
people that began when the legal political prisoner came to Australia. Therefore, now this is the time to uh, recall the people relationship between two nations, which was uh, fostered by humanitarian solidarity and the will to free themselves from oppression. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mas Boni. It was very inspiring. It was very good. Um, yeah, I'm really impressed with the last uh, paragraph that you said, you know, that we should um, remember of this relationship. Um, I'm just feeling a little bit emotional at the moment because, you know, we spend, most Indonesians spend at least 12 years at school, you know, from primary school to finish the high school. But we never learned about this story, you know, which is, is very, you know, it's very sad. But our hope, you know, with this discussion, uh, we hope that, you know, with the story, but this is the real story, it's not, it's not marking up, right? So this is the real story that we should let both nations, Indonesians and Australians know the true story of this relationship, which is very, very important for us, not just for Indonesians, also for, for, for the Australians. Now, um, I just feeling, you know, this is a bit strange if I said this, you know, by uh, when the Dutch bringing all the refugees to Australia and, uh, you know, when the Pacific uh, war broke out and Japan occupied Indonesia, Bob and Eagle prisoners were evacuated to Dutch, to Australia. The transfer was based on concern that the prisoners would rebel if they remained at Bovenigo. It was hoped that the Indonesians brought to Australia would help the Dutch, but it turned out that these political prisoners influenced the Australian trade union to boycott the Dutch ships that landed in the country. After the Allies succeeded in winning, the prisoners were returned to their original places in Indonesia. So it sounds like, you know, we should, you know, as Indonesian, uh, we should thank the Dutch because of these things, because they brought the Indonesians to, to, to uh, the refugees to uh, Australia, and then something happened there, and then the, in, um, and then um, the, Austral the Australian Trade Union boycott the ships, which is meant that you know the Australians support the Indonesian. So that is a very um, I don't know I should say. Uh, is a, a, a strange feeling of, this is just my personal opinion, we should thank the Dutch by bringing them to Australia and change you know, what they expect to. So yeah, so Mas Boni, what do you think about that? Well, we, we don't have to thanks, well, <laughs> the political prisoner from the goal uh, came to Australia because of the Dutch, but we should not, say thanks to the Dutch, of Dutch. course. Okay. Right. Uh, you know, in Indonesia, we have a many uh, blank spot in, in history as a lesson at school, uh, right. for instance. Uh, that's mainly uh, because the way, we, the way we learn the history of, for, for instance, 1926, is always involved, sorry, it always influenced by the understanding uh, of people understanding to the uh, 1965 historical event, right. the, 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 you know, in Indonesia yeah. say PKI yeah. rebellion or uh, the movement of uh, 30 uh, September 1965. Yeah. Well, the way we, you know, learn the history of uh, national awakening uh, of Indonesia, especially in this period, uh, has a you know, problem. For instance, when we discuss about 1926, uh, certain people will assume or even will, 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 uh, will say that this is part of uh, the communist awakening. And then uh, the way we, uh, you know, the way we learn this uh, historical period 
not uh, really become you know uh, becoming biased so to speak because you know many people will always see the communists as a, as a troublemaker mm -hmm. and then uh, you know we have a uh, we have a dark history in 1965 and then before in 1948 and it also it was also involved the, 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 the communists. And then what we don't have in this uh, discussion about 1926, about the communist movement, about the you know nationalist awakening, is the historical context behind of this historical narrative. And then what we and then what might people have here just uh, you know prejudice based on uh, so to speak uh, publicated historical narrative that were uh, created under the Suharto's new order. So we cannot be balanced to understand history, you know, uh, because uh, certain uh, uh, version of history, especially what the uh, communist movement will always seen as a you know, uh, uh, as uh, what you call it, as bad or yeah, as as bad as what communists did in 1965, which is which is still debatable, right? So I think uh, this is one of the best way to learn history by you know discussing about this uh, theme, especially about about the uh, Digul as the as the imprisonment imprisonment uh, camp during colonial era. And even Sarir said that uh, uh, this, uh, what you call it, this uh, imprisonment camp uh, uh, is the evidence that actually uh, the colonial government is a new form of uh, uh, modern fascism. Because they, they have this, uh, you know, imprisonment camp way, way before the Nazi have it. So this is, I think, very, uh, uh, important to you know to learn uh, history from every uh, uh, corner, from uh, every uh, historical narrative uh, uh, possible, uh, and then also from every perspective. So first, I would like to uh, emphasize that we should not say thanks to the Dutch <laughs> just because they you know brought the prisoner to, <laughs> to of course they, they have you know a, a role you know in uh, bringing uh, some people from legal to Australia yeah and then that's why the gamelan ended up <laughs> ended up in Monash University so I think the, the discussion become more important when we see that actually the important uh, relation, I mean, uh, between two people uh, were uh, forced not by the government, not by the elite level, but by, uh, you know, it's a Absolutely. history of people to people. Exactly. I think this is much more, you know, important. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. But, uh, Baboni is very interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much for the explanation. So now um, we move to the next uh, program, which is Boom Jeffrey is going to give uh, a comment about the presentation tonight. Please, Boom Jeffrey. Terima kasih. Uh, sorry, thank you very much. Uh, Moderator Devi Santi. So I just uh, because I just uh, limit have a limited want to uh, straightforward to the content. So I'm uh, Jeffrey Liambo, the Secretary of IDN Victoria. So uh, I just want to put a commentary on the groups of Indonesian diaspora in the 40s. Yeah, uh, these are, there are four that what I got here is uh, Digulis uh, from Boven Digul prisoners, like around 500 people. Uh, the seamen from uh, KPM, uh, Koning Clay Patek Fad Matsupai, uh, consisting of petty officers and ordinary sailors, about 700 more, and Knil soldiers, yeah, uh, around 150, and then the Amtenars of the uh, NAE that uh, I don't know the numbers. So if anyone from the 
uh, from uh, Gerlingrad or Margaret Katomi or Bonnie can give me the numbers. It's good for the antennas in uh, stay in Australia. And also uh, we have Japanese people and also Sundanese and Sumatran, like has been mentioned by uh, Boom Boni, uh, where the essence of the established solidarity of the and the grassroots of grassroots group of the movement and struggle, whether they are communists or nationalists. And the, interestingly, the KPM PT officers in Black Armada movement and Indonesian calling film were mainly Manadonese Christians. So you can see there's many groups, right? And uh, the Indonesian graves in Kora that I've been visited with uh, Mas Iwan Wisono uh, and then organized by uh, uh, Mr. Frank Simamarta are mainly Japanese name. There are four uh, uh, graves, yeah, Japanese name. So you see there's a, um, a variety of groups. And the Diglis, uh, as you can see uh, here, I think it's been explained, Muhammad Bundan is the key person and he's the secretary of Chankin. He's a single uh, man uh, arriving in Cora, but after that moving to uh, Brisbane and uh, got married with Molly. And then it's like, uh, uh, it's the key person of this uh, struggle. I can, I believe that. Like, and also Gamelan Digul at Monash University Melbourne. Uh, yeah, as has been explained, it's a, uh, it's a key artifact for us. And Siti Kamsina is another name. Uh, I think a friend of uh, Prof. Margaret, but I have no idea. I just got it from temanteman.com from uh, Ibu Sally uh, uh, website, Sally Fikri. Uh, is trained nurse. Uh, that probably the first nurse of uh, Indonesian nurse in Australia. And we have Minata uh, as the communist and other rumah Indonesia. Uh, and I just want to move to here. Uh, this is Radio Australia. I found the names of the uh, uh, penyia, uh, broadcaster, and then I found this uh, R. Munanda. Yeah? Uh, I believe it's Raden Munanda. It's 1943. It's a, oh, yeah. A, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, this, is the, uh, uh, this is the other names uh, after 65. Okay, this is the grave. Uh, 13 grave, one no name. Uh, the other two 12, mainly Japanese names. And this is the Kora uh, prison camp. Uh, I've been visited there with Mas Iwan, Bibisono. Uh, so sad if you look at this camp. Because you see that this is Japanese, Italians, and fascists, and also Indonesian uh, mothers and babies uh, in the camp. So yeah, very sad. Uh, this is the list of uh, Indonesian uh, in Australia. Australia, I got it from Diana Pratiwi. And this is the, uh, the key people, the political people that uh, have experienced political experience in Indonesia, but then moved to uh, Australia, they implement the experience. So the, there is a, a good struggle and movement in Australia, which is not considered by the Dutch at the time. And this is the, uh, the children, babies and mothers in Cora. So yeah, when I visited, I, I can imagine this uh, it's very like very sad to 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 think that they are actually in the same camp as uh, uh, as uh, Italian fascist and Japanese military. Yeah, imagine that in the same camp. Okay, uh, this is the list of uh, from Mohammed Bondan, Akenil, uh, the soldiers. When I look at the 150 names here, I look at one by one. It's mainly like 90% Javanese names. So. Uh, it's like, I yeah, that's why Manadonis and Amonis that have been stigmatized as Dutch supporters is actually uh, not happening during, uh, according to this list. Uh, yeah, this is the uh, Cora detained. So this, uh, it's been explained before, it's illegal detention by Jan Lingard. And okay, this is my last uh, uh, commentary. Uh, how many of them? So if anyone from the uh, resources or speakers can help me or anyone uh, in this uh, uh, webinar, how many of them repatriate back to Indonesia? How many of them stayed in Australia? For those in Australia, where are their descendants? If anyone have the information of this, uh, yeah, ID and Victoria really want to know this information. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you both so much. Uh, Bung Jeffrey is very sharp and uh, very um, inspiring too. So we all learned 
from the something that we never heard of before, something that we should remember and celebrate it. Uh, now we have time uh, for the audience to ask questions. To Mungkin Ibu Sally dulu bisa panelist. memberi komentar. Ibu Sally. Sorry. Ibu Sally. Fikri. Fikri. Ibu Sally Fikri. Uh -huh. Mungkin bisa memberi komentar. Yes. Okay, Ibu, Ibu Sally, Sally, apakah Fikri. ada di sini? Ibu Sally Fikri. Ibu Sally Silahkan, Fikri. Ibu. Oh. Halo Ibu Sally. Are you mute? Sorry. Can't hear it. Jeffrey, what's going on? I can't hear you, Ibu. I can't hear you, Ibu. Sorry, uh, Jeffrey, what's going on? Maybe uh, the set, Shelley, the setting, uh, there is, there is the a setting on her computer, maybe. In the left button. On the left button, there is triangle, Ibu Sally. There is a microphone, so probably you can turn on. Oh, okay. I can hear you. On the left there, there is triangle. Maybe you have to set. Okay. Uh, That's okay. Maybe. What, that's okay. What about if you go out and enter again? This uh, hopefully is better. Probably there is an issue. Is better now? Yes, oh, yes. Yes. I can hear you now. Oh, uh, we can hear. I, and Good job. I was just going to say that um, it was a it was a wonderful exercise doing Taman Taman, and there were a great number uh, of generations of postgraduate Indonesians who uh, worked at at least three universities in Queensland. And my husband and I, in the, in the eight years or more that he was honorary consul, had the opportunity to promote a great deal of goodwill um, with the students. So they were always in, in and out of our home, enjoying hospitality and so on. Um, and, and so this was very much a, a shared um, Australian Indonesian experience, uh, writing the website, but the, uh, and I think I've, put that on the chat line. The most critical thing for me at the end of the day, um, and we did an awful lot to promote Indonesian culture, we tried to, um, uh, and we had a lot of support um, both from Australia and from in doing that. We had girls performing in, in various places around the, the city and we had, the government used to bring a whole lot of people to watch our Indonesia Day celebrations and so on. But the most important thing was going to Kara and, and doing the uh, and photographing those graves and posting them on the website because the letters that I got back via email, obviously, uh, from relatives were just absolutely moving and quite inspiring. So, you know, I think um, that I'm very, and we were very honoured, of course, to have it in the National Archive, but it was really more important that we did that little exercise. Um, it was wonderful to go down and see um, what's happened, uh, to listen to what Margaret was saying that happened with Gamera, uh, deep, with the, the um, or, uh, Gamelan, because we wanted to try and bring it to Queensland, but the cost of insuring and of making sure we could find someone who would do such an incredibly priceless and valuable artifact was beyond um, the resources of the universities who wanted to do it at that time. So uh, I just wanted to congratulate you on such a wonderful seminar and uh, Greg and I are honored to be involved. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ibu. Thank you For so much. For people who didn't know Ibu Sally, uh, Ibu Sally is the wife of the former Honorary Consul of the Republic of Indonesia in Queensland, Bapak Greg Fikri next to her. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then she has a great interest in Indonesian culture, particularly oh. in, in the oh, history, food, no, dance, <laughs> and textile. Love Thank you, Ibu Sally, to join. Yeah. <laughs> Thank All right. You Thank you so much, Ibu. We will keep in touch. That's for, for sure. sure. Okay. Thank you. All right. Now, um, we are going to ask questions from the uh audience um okay um 
Unfortunately, uh, if there are questions addressed to Ibu Jen Lingard, uh, who is already left earlier, so please uh, write your questions in the uh, chat rooms, then we can send the email to Ibu Jen and she can answer that later on the date. So please, uh, if any questions to the other panelists, uh, please raise your hand or, or, you know, so we can start. Here's a question from Frida Amran. I'm not sure who, to whom it's addressed to in the chat room. In the chat. Oh, hang on. I think Ibu Margaret Kartomi can probably answer. I'm not sure whether there are other uh, uh, Australian historians uh, uh, that can uh, maybe answer my question. Thank you. Uh, what's the question? Uh, what was the question? Uh, well, but I, I wrote the question in the in the chat, but I'll but so yeah, I live in the Netherlands, <clears throat> and considering, and I know that. Uh, that the Dutch are really great on writing, on collecting and writing personal histories um, of their parents and of their grandparents that uh, that that were um, born in Indonesia at, at the colonial period, the Indisa, the Indisa people, and. Um, um, I can't remember who was it. The last person was. Uh, explaining about the Digulis, and he, <coughs> excuse me, and he um, uh, sort of uh, mixed the the Indonesian people coming from Digul that that came to Australia, and also um, Dutch people that came from Digul to Australia, and. Um, uh, what we have heard from Ibu Margaret, and I, I missed, uh, I'm sorry that I missed uh, Jan's uh, uh, lecture, but what we heard from Ibu uh, Margaret is that, is that a lot of the Indonesian Digulists have shared their stories so that uh, uh, the, the history of the Gamelan is, is known to us. But what I am wondering is uh, whether the Dutch um, Digulists in Australia have also started sharing the, the collective uh, memories of their, uh, yeah, what is it, forefathers, the Nenek Moyang um, that were, that used to be uh, KPM uh, Personalia, that is the shipping company, or maybe descendants of the people that were the guards from Digu that were also sent to Australia. I'm not, I don't know, but I think that if the Dutch ex digulis have also started collecting these uh, this personal uh, histories then it would also give us a very rich um, um, and complete pic almost complete picture of what, what digul was really like at that time thank you yeah. so anybody yeah. can answer actually mm -hmm. probably Bu margaret first thanks <laughs> Yeah, it will, Frida, it's a, it's, it stands to reason that the Dutch would have written about it, but they haven't, yeah. as far as I know. Uh, the people that I talk to, um, none of them have referred to anything like that. But I think the comment from John McBride on, on the chat is quite important, that according to Google, Pramudia Nantator wrote a book titled Charita Dari Digul. It's apparently based on interviews of Digulists about their time there. That might be a very good starting point clue for this, for, the, for your question. But isn't it, it stands to reason that they would. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I but, suppose they would all be dead now is, anyway. There, there wouldn't be any now that would be alive. No, no, no. But the thing is, Ibu, Ibu Margaret, uh, I think that if Pramud, I haven't read the book uh, by Pramudia Anantatur, but if he wrote it, then I think that it would be based on interviews from Indonesians yeah, uh, yeah. that were there at the same time. And uh, my interest of my uh, curi uh, curiosity is actually about the uh, experiences and the observations of the Dutch. Um, uh, you have the prisoners and you have the, 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 the key holders or the, what, what do you say that um, the uh, penjaga penjara 
um, and and they would have different stories about how how they uh, experience the thing. But I'm I'm really interested now um, um, because we are also in in Holland. We we now have a visit by um, uh, uh, Nonya Peters. Uh, but her 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 story is about the Depokers, about people from Depok moving to Australia, and this is another area from another part of Indonesia, another political sphere that has moved to Australia. So the it's it's interesting. I've never really uh, uh, it's it's for me interesting. I'll just keep it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Farida. Is there anyone? Else would like to ask questions? I think there are two, 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 uh, two people raise hands. Raise hands, Anselmo, Jason, and uh, Iwan Vivisono. Oh, okay. All oh, right. Okay. Uh, maybe start with uh, Anselmo, Jason. Hello. Yes, I'm here. Um, I would like to ask a question for Miss uh, Margaret. Uh, just wanted to know your personal thoughts about the entire Gamelan Digul saga because I believe it's a very fascinating tale. So I just wanted to know your personal thoughts on it. Uh, that's all, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, well, I've, it's very meaningful to me and I've written a book on it. And uh, in this book here, I've um, expressed my opinions about various things. And it's also translated into Indonesian, this book. So um, you could read it there, but uh, it's just um, it's a very touching story about the courage of one man and about the power of music both to heal and to provide a locus of resistance. The Gamelan de Gaulle accounts, um, recounts the arrest and imprisonment of a Javanese court musician, Pontiac Nrawit, his building of a prison Gamelan and its eventual restoration in Australia. It's just an amazing story. And uh, uh, of course, uh, I'm fascinated by it because uh, I, uh, I spent 25 years. <laughs> Um, thank you for your comment. I'm glad you were impressed by it. But um, actually, uh, what I said tonight was only a very tiny part of the story. And uh, some of the things I said were wrong, I remember. I mean, I said to um, Dewi, Debbie, that um, it was 25 years that the Gamelan de Gaulle has been at Monash. It's not, it's 45 years. It's just, um, it's <laughs> I probably said some other things tonight that were not absolutely correct too, but it's all in my book, actually. And uh, I think really, you know, it's a very rare thing to see an intimate portrait of a set of instruments, especially one that reveals the role, the role of the instruments in politics and in art and in history and in music and in international relations. I mean, the pictures in the book um, that I've been able to get, they, they alone attest to the spirit of the gamelan and the chance to hear them played by master artist Suwondo, led by uh, Suwardi a while ago. It's a, I'd like to play some more of it, actually. I've got quite a lot I could be playing. Um, if you listen to the music itself, it's um, very, very inspiring and uh, emotionally satisfying. Right. Okay, great. Thank you, Ibu uh, Margaret. So the next, quest, uh, the next question has come from Mas Iwan. Silakan, Mas Iwan. Okay, terima kasih, Ibu Devi. I would like to have a question to uh, Bonnie Triana. Uh, my question is, uh, I got two questions. First, firstly, is apart from the uh, the solidarity of uh, port worker uh, in uh, boycotting the Dutch ship disembark uh, from Australia and going back to Indonesia in order to, uh, to colonize Indonesia back after the, uh, the, the surrender of Japanese. Uh, the, gov the, the Australian government also sending an official delegation to meet uh, Sukarno and Hatta. And at, at that time, I think he's meeting, the, the delegation meeting uh, with Shahrir as well, in order to, uh, to show, uh, to claim the support of uh, the Australian government toward the Indonesian independence. Uh, there must be a background of, of, the, of the, the, the reason. As, as we're understanding that Australia at that time is still uh, under uh, uh, strong influence of uh, British uh, as, they strong, as they strong or traditional alliance, which is uh, they have a different attitude 
toward the Indonesian uh, independent or Indonesian proclamation in 19, 1945. Uh, my second question is uh, so that Indonesia uh, in the uh, negotiation mediated by the United Nations were uh, presented by Australia in the uh, Komisi Tiga Negara, where Dutch were represented by the Belgium and America represent United Nations as the mediation. Uh, I believe you have some, some stuff that you already uh, uh, acquired. So if you could tell us what is the big, uh, what is the big reason uh, in that background? Okay, thanks, Pak Devi. Yeah, silakan Mas Boni. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Mas. Uh, Iwan. Iwan. Mas Iwan. Yeah, uh, I think uh, the relation between Indonesia and Australia uh, in you know governmental uh, level. Uh, strongly related with uh, the foundation or the establishment of the Komisi Tiga Negara. But I don't have any information yet about uh, uh, the relation between uh, uh, the leader between two countries. Uh, because, you know, in Australia at the time, I'm, I, you know, uh, there is a, uh, one of the Political a politician from from Labour Party who also uh, had a good relation with Indonesian leader, but uh, the important relation uh, between Indonesia and uh, in, and and Australia uh, become strongest become stronger when when Australia uh, represented Indonesia in the uh, three country uh, commission. And then uh, the Netherlands was represent, represented by the uh, Belgium and United States in the middle. Um, what I'm talking about is uh, the earlier uh, solidarity that you know uh, developed were not uh, initiated by uh, by the elite level by the governmental uh, level but it was um, initiated by the people it was initiated by uh, political prisoner from the Gul, which was uh, in contact of course at the beginning discreetly discreetly uh, contact with uh, certain uh, political uh, activists uh, in australia such as uh, uh, Molly Bondan, but I'm trying to emphasize that the relation between two people, uh, according to uh, history, is uh, really important. And also for me as a historian, it's uh, more uh, interest to research. Of course, later on in 1947, there was a you know Australian government involvement in trying to help Indonesia negotiate with uh, the Netherlands side because, uh, you know, the Dutch government trying to uh, propagate Indonesia as, a, as a, uh, the fascism puppet established by, by, by the Japanese, by the Japanese. So the Indonesian leader were trying so hard to, uh, what you call it, to, to counter this kind of uh, propaganda at the time. And then also, um, of course, uh, we have a serious problem uh, on how we deal with the uh, Netherlands because they never uh, recognize in the Indonesian independence on August 17, 1945. They always seen Indonesia as a part of uh, Japanese uh, fascism. And then they're trying to downgrade uh, Sukarno as, uh, as a Japanese puppet, as a uh, fascist uh, puppet. And then, you know, uh, with help of uh, Australian people, with help of uh, labor solidarity movement in Australia, 
it the information was widespread to the world that <coughs> Indonesia actually was it's not uh, uh, it's not uh, what you call it uh, uh, made by the Japanese. Indonesia is a free country, and our leader declared the Indonesian independence on August 17, 1945, and that was came from the uh, what you call it from the people of Indonesia, not from the Japanese. I think that is my uh, my point in my uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the explanation, uh, Masponi. Now we're running out of time, but I can take one more question. So it's from uh, Ibu Tuti Gunawan. Yeah. Okay, I would, uh, yeah. So thank you very, thank you very much. I just want to uh, uh, um, comment about Iwan Bibisono's question about what is it that the, why is the, oh, is, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, what what's what's happening to the uh, why Australia uh, is asked to be represent Indonesia? We I have to tell you about the, the troll of a very of one very important person. Um, some of us know her, knew him. Um, his name is Joe Asek. He 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 was he grew up in Central Java. Semarang, and he he so he spoke Dutch uh, in English because he came to Australia later, Javanese and Indonesian and Malayu, and he was a student of Professor McMahon Ball. Now the Prime Minister of Australia at the time uh, wanted to know who is who are these uh, Sukarno Hatta Sharir, are they really? Um, puppets of the Japanese, like some the Dutch said, or who are they? So the chiefly um, told Professor McMahon Ball to go there, to go to Indonesia. And McMahon Ball asked Joe Asek to come with him because he speaks, <laughs> he spoke Indonesian and so on. And so they came in November, 1945. So not long after the proclamation, and so he met Pak Karno, Bung Karno, Bung Hatta, Shahrir, um, and he was he went on. Um, especially he get along very well. The 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 Dutch didn't like that, and the English um, also didn't like. It. But but they sort of um, the established their own connection, talking to them, uh, meeting Sukarno and his wife and his daughter. I think daughter and they were all very impressed with each other and because of the their report to the chiefly government they uh chiefly government became more um more articulate uh, sympathetic to the struggle of the indonesian people and then uh pa Shahrir asked uh, in uh, australian government to represent indonesia in the Komisi tiga negara and as you can, you know, everyone know, this Komisi Ganagara then uh, later worked, um, become um, so that Indonesia's independence was uh, recognized. And but I think without uh, the jasa jasa of uh, Joe Asak, he he later became a professor of economics at Melbourne University and Monash University, and very well known. Uh, unfortunately, he died last year in uh in 90, 92 years old but um i think uh, i i just realized how important his role is when i was when i visited vietnam where i learned about um ho chi minh ho chi minh wrote a letter to uh president of america at the time asking them him to help uh independence of vietnam but unfortunately uh, the president of uh, is Harry Truman, not uh, Roosevelt, because Roosevelt would be more interest, more sympathetic, but to the Vietnamese uh, uh, independent. But Truman resided with France because of the thing in them, and so uh, the, in, um, the nationalism of the um, 
uh, Vietnamese were not recognized. They just thought, well, the Japanese communists. Actually, <clears throat> the Vietnamese didn't like the Chinese at all because they have been, the Chinese have re colonized them for 1,000 years. But because there's, they were against the uh, France, they had to ask the Vietnamese to help them. So I thought that, and this is why um, Joe Asek, I, I keep calling him Pat because we speak Bahasa Indonesia with him uh, some of the time anyway. Um, without his um, laporan to, to, the, to PM Chifley, maybe Indonesia would have to fight the Dutch and also the, uh, the English. Remember that 10th of November, uh, the Orang-Orang Surabaya have killed uh, General Malabi. Malabi, yeah. Um, so if we, we could we could have been uh, fighting a lo uh, much longer war, maybe until until 1975, like the Vietnamese. So we were we were very. I think we should be very thankful for just uh, just that Joe Asek. That's that's my comment. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ibu, for your comment. Uh, now. Um, Thank you for all those questions. And uh, we cannot take any more questions due to time limit. Uh, uh, so. I, I'm, I'm, I saw uh, Mr. Anthony Lee actually raise his hand. Oh, is pa Anthony here? Yeah. He's... Uh, OK. Are we gone? Pa Anthony, are you there? If you want to ask no, he's not in his the chair. last question. I can't see for Anthony. No, I can't see. Ah, it's gone. I think. Maybe is he left? I think I, I saw him raised hand. I mean, literally hand, raised hand. So. Yeah, is, but is he still in the room? No, I don't think he's. I can't see him. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, he's still we in the room. On. Ah, so that's it. Oh. Hi, Anthony. No, Hi, no, Anthony. I, I, I'm looking at. Oh, no, no, it's no one there. Okay. Maybe he can make a comment later. We can continue yeah. and then, okay. yeah. That's okay. Okay, so the next program is to show a short video. Oh, there he is, Pantoni. Oh, Pantoni here? Hello, Pantoni. Uh, you want to ask question or something? Uh, sorry, I, I just wanted to... Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, there was a question from uh, Park Pony. And uh, actually, uh, the lady before me, Dr. Tuti, answered, and 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 okay. that's what I wanted to say. But Professor Joe Isaac and mm -hmm. McMahon Ball, they met the Indonesian leaders leaders in November, nineteen forty-five, yeah. and a film was made about this yes. uh, shown in Jakarta, mm -hmm. and uh, I'll ask. Graham Isaac, the son of uh, um, Joe yeah. Isaac, yeah. to send you a copy of this film. Yeah. Okay, great. It's a okay. very good film. Yeah. yeah. The film was shown in Jakarta and was, was made um, as part of the Two Nations exhibition in Jakarta in November 2019. Mm. Okay, great. So, yes. Okay. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Uh, now we move to the next program is to show a short video of the prisoner of war's camp and Indonesian graves in a small town of Kaura in New South Wales. The grave gradually fell into disrepair and were neglected for many years until 1997. They were identified and subsequently renovated by the Indonesian government and Kaura council and finally, the 13 Indonesians buried there were rightly acknowledged and honored with the official designation as the Juang Kemerdekaan or Freedom Fighters. May they so rest in peace. The video is a courtesy of Mas Gunawan Red and his team who visited the site recently with Indonesian diaspora team and staff from the Indonesian Embassy Canberra in uh, commemorations of Indonesian Heroes Day, November the 10th. Uh, after showing the video, Mas Bella Kusuma from Jembatan Poetry Society of Melbourne will read 
the poignant poem entitled Selamat Tinggal Kora, or Farewell to Kora, written by one of the internees named Mang Komata to mark the end of the chapter of their life. The poem tells of the sadness the Digulis felt when they left behind the graves of those who would not move on with them to a new life. This poem was published in Penulus newsletter in 14 of April, 1944. Please, Bung Jeffrey, video, thank you. Hey. Bella, we read the poetry, the, the poem. Silakan Mas Bella. Selamat tinggal. Farewell, Cora. We who still remain in Cora, three hundred souls, men and women, young and old. All thought we will not be here for long. No, the time has come to head for Queensland and try a new life. In Makaki, no Toowoomba. We live Kora with sorrow and sadness. For yonder outside of town, nine lives. Yes, there were nine to pain and suffering. Seas were lost and closed their eyes. Oh, Kaura, 
breast of mountain. We will always remember you and leave you. Without thought, we will likely never meet again. Selamat tinggal Kora. Kami yang mas tinggal di Kora, 300 jiwa laki-laki dan perempuan, yang tua dan yang muda. Kami semua berpikir tidak akan lama lagi di sini. Sekarang waktunya telah tiba untuk menuju Queensland. Mencoba hidup baru. Dimakai, bukan ditumba. Kami meninggalkan Kora dengan penderitaan. Dan rasa sedih. Di sana, di luar kota, sembilan nyawa. Ya, ada sembilan nyawa. Setelah rasa sakit dan pedih, terhenti hilang, dan mereka menutup mata. Okora, oh, tempat yang berbukit-bukit, kami akan selalu mengingatmu dan meninggalkanmu dengan pikiran bahwa kami sepertinya tidak akan pernah bertemu lagi. 300 jiwa laki-laki dan perempuan. Terima kasih. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mas Bella. It's very very good. Keren banget, Mas Bella. <laughs> that's the end of the webinar tonight. On behalf of Indonesian Diaspora Network Victoria, I would like to thank you to our guest speakers for the great presentations and knowledge that we bring home tonight. Thank you to Ambassador Williams and Bapak Nicholas Manopo for their support to this event. And last but not least, great appreciation to all ID audience who participate and support this webinar. Thank you and stay tuned to our next event. Have a great, have a great weekend. I will give the time back to uh, the hosts. Uh, Boom, Anton. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Miss Davy, uh, for being in the discussion program quite interestingly and dynamically. Uh, so interesting that we, we we are carried away by you know, the, the 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 things that we discussed tonight. And on behalf of IDN Victor, I would like to express again our deep, deepest gratitude to the speakers, Miss John Lingard. Professor Margaret Cartomi, Mr. Boni Triana, and again also the Australian Embassy in Jakarta, Ambassador Williams, and Indonesian Embassy in Canberra, represented uh, by Bapak Nicholas, Nicholas Manopo on behalf of Pak Sharif Alatas for attending and delivering the remarks. And of course, to all similar participants, whether there, wherever you are, whether you are in, in Australia, Indonesia, in Europe, or wherever you are. And thank you in the next webinar. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And I think, oh, I'm sorry. I do it. Jeffrey, yeah, are we going to take another picture or? Oh, uh, yes. uh, please turn on your video. Yeah. Okay, yes. right. The last uh, photos. The last photos, photos before we close the events. Yep, thank you. Yeah, there is last. Don't forget uh, to smile. Uh, last picture, uh, sorry. Uh, last pictures, one second. I just want to set up things. Uh, okay, there are. Uh, One second. I'm going to smile. Okay. Uh... <laughs> Sudah? Jeff. Frozen ya dia ya? Oh, Jeffrey. What's happened? <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Kita udah senyum senyum yeah, yeah, yeah. ya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm I'm muted myself. Sorry. Okay, uh, do it again. Actually, I'll, I'll okay, smile yeah. again. One, two, three. So, uh, okay. Uh, now we move to second page. Uh, one sec. Uh, second page. I'm gonna save it first.
second page uh please be ready uh okay one two three okay uh that's it and then i'm going to close it with the video from uh idn victoria is that right okay. uh, yeah. yep that's the one that's a showcase of uh, our activities I mean, by the Indonesian Network. Everyone and would like to after, stay. After this video, I'm going to stop the YouTube live and mm -hmm. then uh, we can continue discussing. Uh, right. Yeah, okay. if people like to stay around to chat yeah, with us, that would be fantastic. That would be great. Cool. Yep. Thank All you. Right. So, uh,